Hello and welcome to the Chauvenar new webinar. Today we're going to look at new earth resistance testing techniques. My name is Kevin Smith, I'm Business Development and Marketing Manager here at Chauvenar New, and I'm going to be your presenter during this webinar. If you'd like to connect with me after the webinar, I'm available via LinkedIn. So for those of you who don't know anything about Chauvin Arnoux, we were founded in Paris in 1893 by Raphael Chauvin and René Arnoux. Chauvin Arnoux has played a major role in the history of test and measurement. We have a long and prestigious list of inventions, such as the universal tester, the ancestor of the multimeter, and the current clamp. In the 20th century, more than 350 patents and brands were registered by Chauvin Arnoux. Just to give you an idea of some of the, the numbers, we have around 100 million euros uh, each year in uh, sales revenue. We have 10 subsidiaries spread across the world, of which the UK subsidiary is one of those. We have around 900 employees, seven production sites, six R&D departments, and we're very proud to say that we spend 11% of our revenues in R&D, ensuring that we innovate the latest and newest products. So welcome to the webinar. There's a few things that we need to go through um, before we get started. So the first one is testing, testing, one, two, three. So just make sure that you can hear us, that you've got the volume set correctly. If there is any problems with sound, just check your headphone connection, check your, you know, your speaker volumes and things like that. Um, if you do get, you know, problems where you, you are struggling to follow what's going on, um, sometimes logging off the session and back on again is is uh, a good opportunity. So just make sure you've got everything dialed in and you can you can hear us and see everything that's going on during the session. So the session is going to be approximately one hour in length, and we also have a live Q and A session at the end. So once we finish the formal presentation, you'll get the chance to actually ask us questions, and we'll answer those live during the session. So um, you can use the chat box for your questions. So there's a, a chat or questions box on your go-to toolbar. If you have a look at that, um, you can type in questions and I say we'll either answer them during the session or we'll save them for the live chat at the end. Um, so please do get your questions in. It's really good when we get that level of interaction. Also, remember to download the presentation handouts. Again, in the go-to toolbar, you'll see the handout section and in there you will see a PDF of the presentation slides. So remember to download those before you leave the session so you've got a copy of the the slides there to refer back to later on um you'll also receive a certificate after the end of the session so once once the uh the session's been completed um usually a few days later um you'll actually receive a, a certificate of attendance um via email so that's something to, to look out for and the video will be available soon at our uh, media channel our media website which is www.cauk.tv so normally about a week after we've done the sessions, um, we'll put those up on there. And if you want to have a look at previous sessions, um, it's definitely worth going onto that website and have a look and you can see all of our previous webinar content. So what are we going to cover today? So we've called this session New Earth Resistance Testing Techniques. And really this is a follow on from our last session where we looked at an introduction to earth resistance testing. And we wanted to talk you through some of the more complicated and some of the more advanced uh, ways that we can actually test earthing systems because if you know what you're doing with these and you use these techniques in the right way they can really improve the speed uh, of what you're carrying out and actually limit the disruption uh, to the electrical installation as well so we're going to start off with advanced testing methods detailed in IET guidance note 3 so IET guidance note 3 does cover earth resistance testing and in there there's three methods um, for carrying out earth resistance uh, testing Two of the methods we already covered in the last webinar and um, the actual clamp-based or stakeless type testing that's covered in Guidance Note 3 is what we're going to look at in this webinar. So we just wanted to give you a bit of an overview there and just show you what, what methods are covered under the IET Guidance Note 3 and covered under the, the uh, 18th edition of the wiring regulations. Um, so that's where we're going to start off. Then we'll move on to look at um, clamp or stakeless earth resistance testers to verify earthing systems so have a look at some of the different um, ways we can we can use clamps um, to actually help with our earth resistance testing then we're going to have a look at a, a, a really great um, product from Chauvin Arnu, uh, which allows us to do fast testing of a, the earthing systems for high voltage pylons and other earth metallic structures stru such as uh, street lighting columns so we've got an adapter that goes with our with our um, 
uh, 6472 Earth Resistance Tester that actually allows us to use um, Rogowski coils to actually carry out um, testing of these items, but in a, in a different way without having to do the normal fall of potential type tests. So that's really sort of interesting, really speeding up the way that we can carry out that sort of testing. Then a bit of bonus content. It wasn't wasn't on the initial uh, initial running order, but we've just added it in because it really fits in with this and it's actually a, a good topic to, to have a look at, is we're going to have a bit of a detailed look at soil resistivity testing. Because obviously, if you're going to site an earth electrode, you're going to decide where your earth electrode's going. Carrying out a soil resistivity survey first is, is a, a prudent method because obviously that tells you where you know where is the optimal position to site your electrode so rather than just picking at random where you're going to put your electrode in and then finding you know you've got to spend more money on additional electrodes or you've got to drive it down really deep or you can't get decent readings actually carrying out a soil resistivity test first is a is a you know really good starting point so we're going to have a look at that and then finally we're going to finish up with a a bit of an overview of the advanced earth testing products so you can actually see what products we've got on offer from Chauvinanu to carry out all the tests that we talked about during the rest of the webinar. So that said, let's get started. So in this section, we're going to have a look at the advanced earth testing methods detailed in IET Guidance Note 3. So those of you who carry out testing to uh, BS7671 will be familiar with, with IET Guidance Note 3. Guidance Note 3 is the guidance note that details all the inspection and testing requirements. Um, and it's really the Bible for inspection and testing under the, the 18th edition of the wiring regulations. So within um, Guidance Note 3, they actually look in detail at earth electrode resistance testing. And they list three methods. So there is three methods that are, are detailed within um it guidance note three so the first one they call e1 and that's the fall of potential method so you'll remember from the last webinar we talked in detail about the fall of potential method and the fall of potential method is where we have the the spike on the test we put in two uh further test spikes and then we move the spike 10 percent closer 10 percent further away we average out the values and that gives us our our resistance measurement so that's that's pretty much the sort of the standard um earth resistance test is method e1 and the fall of potential method if you do want more information on that as i say have a look at the recording of our, our previous session that was covered in there um we also covered last last time in the last webinar uh, method e3 now e3 is almost not really an earth an earth resistance measurement it's 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 another type of test really but it, it is used very commonly for testing earth resistance um, particularly in tt systems and this is doing an earth fault loop impedance test so actually carrying out an earth fault loop impedance test um with something like a multifunction test or an earth fault loop impedance tester um so those two methods there e1 and e3 are covered in guidance note three and we did talk about those methods extensively in the, the last webinar where we looked at sort of basic you know an introduction to earth resistance testing today what we're going to look at is method e2 um, and e2 actually covers probably two or three different different methods different ways of of testing um but it's basically using a clamp type um system so whether that's the the stakeless methods or whether that's a selective method used a single clamp um but e2 is is really what we're going to look at today so all of the stuff that we we have talked about previously and that we are in here are talking about in here is generally covered within iet guidance note three although when we start to look at things like obviously pylon testing and stuff like that obviously that doesn't generally fall within within the scope of the 18th edition um but Obviously, when you look at Guidance Note 3 for testing, this stakeless testing is actually covered in there. Sometimes people don't realise it's covered in there and think that it's sort of, you know, some sort of special technique or something, but it is covered within IT Guidance Note 3. So for those of you who are testing under the 18th edition, it's worth knowing about and worth, worth considering as an option. Now let's take a look at using a clamp or stakeless earth resistance testers to verify earthing systems. 
Jovanano are world leaders in the design and manufacture of sensing coil based test and measurement solutions. You'll remember from the first few slides actually that Jovanano were the company who invented the clamp meter. So you can see that we have got a long history in this area. Uh, this technology can be used to enhance the existing earth testing methods and also gives us new ways to test earthing systems quickly with little disruption. When considering which test methods to select, it is important to understand the need for and benefits of using clamp-based methods. So the first method we're going to have a look at here is how we can actually use a clamp to enhance the, uh, the testing that we're doing. So using a single clamp added to a standard earth potential method, we can confirm individual electrode resistance in a multiple electrode system without the need to disconnect. So if we're actually connecting up and we're doing a normal normal um, fall of potential test, normal, normal uh, earth electrode resistance test, the problem with that is that we do need to disconnect the earth electrode. If we're going to disconnect the earth electrode, we need to actually isolate the installation because we don't want the installation working when we've disconnected the earth because potentially there could be a fault. It could be very dangerous. So we need to disconnect the earthing. It means we've got to have a shutdown, all those sort of things. Now, if we use a tester that's actually got the ability to use a current clamp in addition to doing the test, and this would be, for example, our um, CA6471 um, or 6472 testers. What you can do with those is we actually use a clamp and we place that clamp around the earth electrode or the conductor going to the earth electrode. And in a multiple electrode system, or it could be not so much multiple earth electrodes, but it could be that you've got parallel paths. You could have extraneous conductive parts like water pipes, structural steel work, those sort of things acting acting as parallel paths. So the problem being that if you didn't <coughs> disconnect the earth electrode and you carried out the test with everything connected, you're actually getting the parallel resistance of all of those earth electrodes and parallel paths together. So potentially you could have a very poor earth electrode resistance, but very good connection of your structural steel work or water pipes to the ground. And you wouldn't really know that the earth electrode was actually faulty. So in this case, what we can do is, is we can use the clamp as an additional part of that. And what that will do is it measures the currents going just through that earth electrode. So it can then compare that to the overall resistance reading and work out what's in the parallel paths and what's actually going down the earth electrode under test. And we don't need to disconnect it. We can carry out the test and we can actually work out. So this is what we call a selective method. It means we can select the individual earth electrode we want to test. We put the clamp around that or the conductor going to it, and we can actually measure that electrode in isolation, even though it's still connected to the rest of the earthing system. So this is a really sort of quick, reliable way of doing it to get just the information we want without disrupting the electrical installation and having to isolate and turn off and causing downtime and things like that. So this is a great feature, and this is this is a feature, as I said, that's available on our, our CA6471, 6472 um, testers, um, and it's really worth having a look at if you want to minimise the disruption when you're doing um, earth resistance testing, or you've got multiple earth paths and you need to be able to work out you know, what's actually the, the resistance of each of those paths separately. Now, moving on from the the uh, selective method. Um, now we actually move into what we generally call a stakeless method. So the selective method, we still used earth spikes, we still use test spikes, it's still a fall of potential test. We're just using the current clamp to differentiate, to select which earth electrode we're testing. Whereas in a stakeless method, we actually don't use any additional earth stakes at all. So this is really clever technology. And the way it works is in a stakeless method, we have two coils that we use. The first coil induces a voltage into the circuit and the second coil measures the current that flows. From the known values of voltage and current, the loop resistance can then be calculated. This resistance can be taken as the earth electrode resistance. So you'll see from the diagram on the left there, what we're actually doing is we're using two coils. Now, these could be two separate coils, as we'll see in a moment, or these could be two parts of a dual coil clamp. 
but effectively we're using two coils one with a generator that generates the voltage in the circuit that we're measuring another sensing coil that actually measures that the current that flows and then from those we know what the voltage is going in we know what the uh, what the current flow is so from that we can work out the resistance of that loop so what we are doing is we are working out the resistance of of that loop so we need a loop to measure so this is only really effective on systems where you've got multiple earth connections or you are trying to verify the resistance of a a loop a circuit loop so not this doesn't work on just a single electrode on its own you can't actually just put it around a single electrode and expect it to work because there's no circuit there's no connection for you to actually induce that voltage into but if you've got multiple earth spikes or even you know you can if you wanted to put in a separate test spike or you can connect to something that's that's got a connection with earth we carry out the test and we actually get that resistance reading now we've said the resistance can be taken to be the earth electrode resistance in reality we know that the actual resistance of the spike will be less because it's going to include the resistance of the the second spike or the the earthing system the parallel earthing system that's there but we know that the actual resistance of the the spike we're testing is always going to be less than the reading that we get and the more parallel paths we've got the closer the reading that we're we're taking actually gets to being the true earth electrode resistance but we know it's always going to be lower so we can take that as you know, sort of worst case scenario value. So I said we can do this method by either using two um, clamps. So you can see here an example of using our CA6471, uh, 6472 type testers to do this loop resistance measurement. And you can see on the diagram there, the guy where he's got the, the two clamps and one of those is, is inducing the voltage, the other one's measuring. And from that, then we can measure that loop resistance and we actually get the value of the loop resistance in there so again you can see from the diagram just what i was talking about about the parallel earths and obviously those parallel earths we are going to get the resistance of those but the more we've got in parallel the lower that combined parallel resistance is and the less effect it's going to have on the actual earth electrode resistance we've got the other thing we need to be careful of is that there isn't any sort of strange loops that we aren't taking the reading in any any funny places so sometimes if we weren't actually taking the, the resistance measurement at the point where it goes to an individual spike, maybe we were measuring actually somewhere further up on maybe a lightning protection system or an earth bar. What we might get is almost a short circuit within the system. So instead of measuring through the ground, we've actually got another loop and we're actually measuring through a loop of the, the lightning protection system or the earthing system or structural steel work. So again, we do need to be careful that when we are carrying out these tests that we are carrying it out on the right conductor, the conductor that's going to the earth spike under test. We're not carrying out this where there's going to be other parallel sort of connections off to the side of that that could cause strange parallel loops and we actually get very low readings because we're just actually measuring through the earthing system, not the soil. Now, just the same as we looked at on that diagram that we can do with two coils, what we can do with our, our CA6416, 6417, 6418 testers is we can actually use these dual coil clamps. So effectively, it's a single clamp, but inside that clamp head, there are two coils. So it's doing exactly the same as you saw where the guy was there with his two clamps. Um, one is inducing the voltage, the other one is actually measuring the current that flows, and from those two we work out the resistance. Um, but we're doing it actually with one device. So by doing this with one clamp, we can actually clamp on, and if we have got those systems, it's a very, very quick, very, very efficient way of actually doing these tests. We literally clamp it on, and straight away, within a matter of seconds, we've got a reading there for that, that loop. So if you are testing, for example, lightning protection systems and things like that, these products are, are very, very good in that type of environment because you've got multiple Earths and we're actually going in and we're, we're checking these and literally you clip it on and within a couple of seconds, you've got a reading. There's no need to put any spikes out. There's no need to find any areas where you can actually put spikes in, you know, if you've got concrete and all that sort of thing um but as i said the only considerations we do need to to look at is that we don't get any sort of parallel um 
paths, you know, that we are clipping it on to the right, the right conductor, because if we do get these parallel loops, these sort of short circuits. Um, one great feature of these testers as well is they do have a built-in loop alarm warning. Um, so you can actually set the threshold. So if you do get a very low value, say below an ohm, um, it will actually come up and say loop and it'll just remind you that potentially you have got a, a parallel current loop and maybe you're you're measuring in the wrong place. So you do need to have a look just to make sure that you are measuring correctly. So they do build have an alarm built into them for that function just to remind you. But, you know, if you are testing things with multiple multiple connections to Earth, this is a very, very quick, very reliable, very accurate and easy way to actually carry out those tests. So definitely worth having a look at these type of testers. Now let's take a look at the fast testing of high voltage pylons and other earth metallic structures. Traditionally, the testing of pylon earthing has been carried out by using the traditional fall of potential test method. As you can imagine, inserting test spikes outside of the pylon zone of influence can mean large distances between test spikes, very long test leads, and a lot of walking. Luckily, Chauvin Arnu have a test solution which solves all of these problems and is much quicker too. So if you look at the diagram on the right hand side there, you can see that we use the uh, CA6472 earth resistance tester and we connect that to our pylon test box which is the CA6474. The pylon test box then connects through to four Rogowski coils and these Rogowski coils fit around the legs of the pylon and actually allow us to measure the current that flows through them during testing. So four coils are placed around the pylon legs and just two spikes inserted at 90 degrees to the overhead line. So we put two spikes out either side at 90 degrees to the overhead line and we perform a single test and this gives us the resistance of all four legs. So this is very similar to a sort of selective method that we looked at before, only in this case we're actually using four coils and we're using two uh, test spikes. So what that actually gives us is the ability to see the resistance of each leg by just carrying out one simple test. But we can also see loads of other information as well. We can see the current flowing through the legs. Um, we can test at different frequencies and all sorts of things. So there's a lot more data that we can actually gather from this test method. But as you can see, it's a hell of a lot quicker than actually carrying out a fall of potential test, potentially for each leg of the pylon. So the large flexible Rogowski coils will fit any size of pylon leg. So the normal Rogowski coils, you know, are very, very big. And you can see in this case, we can actually get sort of three coils all the way around the leg of a, a very big um, pylon leg there. Um, but these Rogowski coils can be made in any length. So potentially anything that we need to fit these round, we can, we can get a Rogowski coil to do that. This method gives resistance data for each leg and also the leakage current too. This method is more than four times quicker than the fall of potential method. So you can carry out this test you know, a, a lot quicker than carrying out fall of potential. So for anybody who's actually out there doing this type of testing, there's real efficiency savings and there's real time savings to be had. So while four coils are used um, to test the four legs of a pylon, uh, the same method can be used with less coils to test other earth metal items. So here on the right, you can see uh, the test being performed using one coil on a street lighting column. So in this case, we, we connect one coil up, we set the adapter box to, to tell it that it's just using one coil. We make our connections onto the, the lighting column above the coil. And you can see there, we've actually, in this case, used the magnetic, uh, magnetic connections to actually uh, connect onto the lighting column. Uh, and then we carry out the test. And again, exactly the same. We get the earth resistance reading, we get any leakage currents and all those sort of things. And it's, it's a really quick, easy way of doing it. We haven't got to disconnect anything. We haven't got to even open up the column or do anything, you know, to, to, to interfere with it in any way. It's a really unintrusive uh, method. And, and again, really quick. So now let's take a look at soil resistivity testing. 
Plural resistivity, often referred to by the letter rho, is expressed in ohm meters or ohms per meter. By measuring it, you can find out how well the soil conducts electric currents. So the lower the resistivity, the lower the earth electrode resistance will be at that location. And you can see in the table on the right hand side here, depending on what type of soil you've got, um, you will have an expected level of resistivity. So obviously if you've got very stony ground, your resistivity is going to be quite high. Um, whereas if you've got a, uh, you know, quite a, a wet um, clay type ground or sedimentary type ground, uh, then you're looking for quite low resistivities. So soil resistivity surveys can be used for all sorts of things. They can be used for geographical surveys and trying to work out, you know, what's actually going on in the ground. Um, but in our case, what we're looking at these for is we're looking at where to site an earth electrode. We're looking at the optimum position for siting of an earth electrode so that we can actually, you know, position it correctly and we know what's going on. So soil resistivity measurements help us to choose the location and type of earth electrodes and earth networks before building them. That's very important. It's the, the before building them part that we can actually do these surveys in advance. We can define electrical specifications for earth electrodes and earth networks, and we can optimise the construction costs for the earth electrodes and earth networks. And what we mean by optimised construction cost is, is it's quite an efficient way of doing it. If we know what size earth electrodes we're going to need, we know where we're going to put them, um, it removes all the trial and error from the process. So as a result, they are used on construction sites where it's important to choose the best position for the earth electrode. So we've got an empty field. We know we need to put an earth electrode in there. We can work out where's the best position to put it in for the most cost effective, easiest, quickest position, and obviously be able to use the smallest electrodes and the, the cheapest electrode to attain the same, you know, earth resistance that we would have. So it takes all the guessing out of it. It takes all the trial and error out of it, and it really makes the whole process so much more efficient. The results of a resistivity survey can be a simple list of values in a table or presented as a visual plot. The use of third-party software like Zond Res2D, shown here, allows resistivity data to be shown in 2D or even in 3D. So again, it might be that we just do a straight line of 10 plots in a row, and we just want to know what the resistivity is you know, along this, this straight line. And we might just put the values in a table and we can see, right, there's some high values, there's some low values. We want to, really want to be putting it where the low values are. But if you want to go into more detail, you can actually plot this out, as you can see there with this software. So you can actually see exactly the plot. You can see the depths and, and all those sort of things of, of where it is. Um, and we can even do these, as you can imagine, on a 3D plot. Because in two dimensions, we can plot out like a little grid pattern. And we can see where, you know, the resistivity is lowest at a set depth. Or we can actually add the third dimension to that, the depth to it, and actually get a full plot of, you know, the soil resistivity at certain depths within that location as well. So really it is the sky's the limit, and it depends on what level of accuracy you want, what level of detail, what resolution, and all those sort of things, and how far you want to go with this. But soil resistivity testing is a really important tool for us to use if we are actually citing earth electrodes and we want to know where to you know where to place them beforehand so we must first define the survey area so we've got a field and what we need to do is decide right where in there are we actually going to survey where are we going to put this earth electrode eventually so we define the survey area we say right that's the logical place where we're allowed to put it and obviously when we're considering that, we might be avoiding ditches and drains and hedges and overhead lines and all of the things that we, you know, areas where we, we know we're not going to be able to install or we're not going to be able to dig. So we define the area. And then what we've got to do is decide what resolution we want to measure to. So what spacing of our measurements are going to be. So we can define our, our measurement grid. Now we could go down to, you know, a meter by a meter grid. And we'll have loads of values and loads of detail, loads of resolution to our plan. We might decide, well, actually, you know, we don't need to go to that level. We want to go to a 10 meter spacing. We want to go to a five meter spacing. We can decide what we do because this, this isn't to do with the actual spacing of our, of our earth electrodes for testing purposes. 
this is our survey grid. So this is where we want to take the measurements. So when we're laying out the grid, we can just do this with a simple tape measure and some marker cones or flags. Um, but if it's a bigger system and we've got access to a surveyor with GPS, we could actually get the surveyor to actually lay out the grid for us, mark this out. But I think it is from experience, it is a good idea to actually physically mark out the grid by using some cones or flags or markers, golf tees, something like that. So you've actually got the grid defined and you know where you are looking to measure. Because as I said, the grid is the measurement grid. This isn't necessarily where you're going to put your earth electrodes when you're doing the testing so this is the measurement grid this is the level of accuracy the resolution that we want to go to and then obviously we can lay that area out and we know where we're going to do our testing now the next decision is the survey depth so we can we can actually survey at a single depth if we want to so we could just do the whole lot at one depth say three four five meters deep and we just do the whole lot at that depth and that's it so it's sort of 2d type plot um or we could actually conduct the measurement at multiple depths and that would give us a 3d plot of what's actually going on now the thing to consider um is actually the type of earthing system to be installed and its typical depth so if you know you're going to install an earthing grid and the earthing grid is usually installed at a depth of say two meters well then really you want to survey at two meters because you know that's basically where you're going to put it there's no point surveying at 50 meters deep if you know you're only going to dig down say two meters to put your your uh, your earthing earthing grid or earthing plate in similarly if you're using an electro and you know your typical electrode length is say three meters or five meters or ten meters again that gives you an idea of the depth that you're going to actually want to measure too because again you know that does make a difference and, and with with soil resistivity generally the further down you can get the lower the soil resistivity is going to be and the more consistent as well so soil resistivity can change a lot with weather conditions um, particularly near the surface so generally if we can get down through that and we can actually measure a bit lower we get an actual a more reliable picture but again there's no point if our earthing system is not going to go down that far if we're going to dig a trench and put an earthing tape in or something like that there's no point measuring the resistance below where the trench is going to be because we want to know at that depth so again we just need to need to consider these things when we're actually setting our survey depth now one test will be required for each point on the survey grid and for each depth so if you look on here we've actually got i think in this survey grid it's nine by eight so that's 72 separate measurements will be required just to do one depth if we're doing that at multiple depths then obviously you multiply that up by the number of depths we're actually going to do so you know you can see how quite quickly we can end up with a lot of tests that we've got to carry out to actually do this so it is important that we actually balance the amount of data required what do we need to know to actually place our earthing system versus the practical considerations of actually performing these tests because as we said it is a multiplication game the more depths the more we're multiplying those points by and if we don't need that level of data then really you know we're, we're making more work for ourselves than we actually need but just be aware this is quite a slow process obviously for every dot in that grid we've got to put four electrodes in we've got to take a measurement and then for the next dot we've got to move them we've got to position them again take measurements again and keep going so you can see how it it is quite a, a slow process to do this um but it is building up the data and you know you've got to balance your your level of data against um against the work involved and it's always better to you know to do the work to do the due diligence than to get lazy with it and go oh actually i'm just going to do a couple of measurements and call that quits because really you're not gaining the information that you want so you do need to balance the data that you require against the practical considerations to make sure you're actually doing the measurements that you need to do. So there's a couple of different methods for doing soil resistivity um, testing. And the one that's used, used most nowadays particularly is the Wenner method. Um, and on our testers particularly, but you'll see this in, in equations and things like this, um, we use the letter rho the Greek letter rho for resistivity um, and the rho with a little w by it means that it's a resistivity derived from the the Wenner method 
Um, so when we see, you know, row W, that means that it's it's the Wenner method for, for discerning the resistivity. So the Wenner method is the most common and uses four evenly spaced test electrodes. So you can see from the diagram on the right hand side here that they're spaced out at distance A. So we have two current spikes on the outside and then we've got two potential spikes on the inside but they are spaced out all at the same distance a so the two current spikes inject the current the two potential spikes measure the voltage difference and from that they can work out the resistance of the ground now <clears throat> the resistivity is measured at point zero so you can see on the diagram point zero so that's halfway between the two central spikes. That's halfway between the two potential spikes in the middle, the central spikes. So it's the center point, and it's at a depth of three quarters of the spacing A. So three quarters A down. So this is really important. Sometimes people struggle with this when they're doing the measurement. So on our measurement grid, all of those little dots that we marked out on our grid they are all meant to be representations of point zero. So when we're doing a measurement at point zero, we space out our measurement electrodes to carry out that measurement at that central point. So as I said before, we're not putting our measurement electrodes in at those dots that are on there. We're putting them out spaced apart, as you can see by this, by distance A, spaced away from that central point so that's really important and it's the same with the depth when we're looking at the depth obviously the depth is three quarters of a so if we want to measure deeper we increase the value of a out so we, we increase a by increasing a three quarters of that is the depth so that's how we actually measure deeper if we were doing this so say we had a, a value of A of 4 metres, 3 quarters of that would be 3 metres. So we'd be measuring 3 metres down. So if we've got a spike separation of 4 metres, we'd be measuring it 3 metres down. If we wanted to have a spike separation of 8 metres, then obviously we'd be measuring it 6 metres down. So again, it's these multiples we can use to actually work out what the actual measurement grid is going to be. Now, the measurement depth is set by spacing A, as we said. And the other thing that we need to consider is actually how far we insert the test electrodes. Because we don't insert these very far into the ground at all. The test electrodes must be inserted at a depth of less than a 20th of A. So we take A, we divide it by 20, and that's the maximum insertion depth for the test electrode so that's very important that we actually measure that if we put them in too far then we, we we sort of we're not sure exactly the depth that we're measuring at so it's it's important that to it to you know maintain the accuracy of this model that we only insert them less than a 20th of of that distance a so to actually get the resistivity we take the resistance that we measure and we use the equation you can see at the bottom there to give us the resistivity using the Wenner method. So that's quite straightforward how we do it. We connect up the cables, we connect up the test spikes, we, we work out our dimensions in advance, we know exactly what we're doing, we measure it all out, and we carry out the measurements. So the test grid uh, must be basically measured so at each point on the test grid um, with the electrode spacing A set for each required measurement depth. Simple resistivity testers um, will give a resistance reading from which the resistivity value will need to be calculated. More advanced testers have this function built in. So some resistance testers just give you a reading in resistance and use the equation on the previous slide to calculate the resistivity. Others, you just tell them what method you're using, what the spacing is of the electrodes, and it will automatically work out resistivity for you from that. So you can see on the right-hand side there the sort of rough setup that we've got. We talked about that in the diagram. And then what we need to do is we continue to move that for each 
point zero for each of those um, spacings in the grid and for each depth. And from that, we build up all of the data that we need for that resistivity survey. Now, the second method, I did say there was two methods in there. And we have the Schlumberger, or sometimes Schlumberger, but uh, Schlumberger, I believe is the correct pronunciation, method. Um, and this is denoted by the row with a little S by the side of it. So if you see a row S, it means it's a resistivity derived from the, the Schlumberger method. And this is very similar to the Wenner method. When you look at it, you'll think it's hardly any different. And in certain configurations, actually, it is the same. Um, but the difference with this is that you can actually have an irregular spacing for the, the spikes. So we keep the potential uh, spike difference, A, the same. And we can move the spacing of the current spikes out further. So what we can do is we can actually use that to measure at different depths while leaving the two central spikes the same. So if we wanted to do it, just do a, a depth survey, we just wanted to measure a different depth at the same point, we could use the Schlumberger method and actually just keep increasing D and that would just measure deeper and deeper and deeper into the ground. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's a, a way of doing it where we want to vary the depth and actually just leave two of the spikes the same. Whereas using the Wenner method, we could do exactly the same, but we'd have to move the spacing of all four spikes out. Now, because it's a slightly more complicated method, you get a more complicated equation. So you can see the equation down there at the bottom. And often this is why a lot of people don't like using this method, because obviously the math is a little bit more complicated. Although if you have got one of our automatic uh, soil resistivity testers, they will work that out for you. Um, so it takes all the, all the calculation hassle out of doing it. Um, I believe this method was popular sort of, uh, you know, a bit, a bit of a long time ago. Um, not so much recently because it relied a little bit on the, the different accuracies of testers and also the, the sort of the, the power of the current that they were able to generate and those sort of things. So I think it was more, more built around older, older testers and older test methods. So it does tend to be nowadays that most people just use the Wenner method. Um, it's easy, it's straightforward. I know you've got to move the spikes a little bit more, but it, it is understood and it's easy to understand and easy to replicate. So we mentioned the, the Schlumberger method here just for completeness, really. But generally, if you're going to be carrying out these tests, we would recommend that you carry them out using the, the Wenner method. So we've had a look at all of the different uh, different earth resistance test methods that we're going to talk about today. Um, but what we want to do just to finish up is have a look at the equipment available. So that if you want to carry out these tests, what equipment do you actually need and what have we got available from Chauvin Arnu for you? So we'll start off with the, the clamp-on earth resistance testers. Now, generally, we've got two of these, the uh, 6416 and the 6417. And these incorporate the dual coil design that we talked about before in the, in the head. Um, so as we said, these are really quick. They're an easy way to test systems with multiple earth spikes or, or multiple earth paths. Um, and they are, they are, you know, really the standard method of doing those nowadays. It's really quick, really easy. You just clamp it round, it gives you the reading. And it's, you know, it's a really sort of straightforward way of doing it. The difference between the two of the 6416 and 6417 is the 6417 actually has Bluetooth. Um, so that will connect through to our dedicated Android app. So it depends whether you want the Bluetooth connectivity or you don't in there, whether you go for the 6416 or the 6417. One seven, but they're both brilliant products, really easy to use, and really, if you are testing things like lightning protection systems where you've got multiple Earths, this is pretty much now the standard way to do it. Now, if you are testing a little bit bigger, uh, bigger things, maybe you're testing lightning protection systems that have got sort of copper buzz bars, copper earthing straps, that sort of thing, or you need to test um, sort of bigger um, conductors. Um, we do actually do the 6418 now, which is very similar to the 6416. It doesn't have the, the Bluetooth of the 6417. Um, but it has got a larger jaw, and you can see the jaw dimensions actually listed there. So it's designed perfectly to go around the sort of earthing straps and things like that that you'd find associated with lightning protection systems. So certainly one to consider if you are actually carrying out these measurements. Maybe you want the... Uh, the tester with the slightly bigger jaws just to make sure that it will it'll get around everything that you want to test now we talked about um being able to do the uh the stakeless uh type tests 
um, with just using additional clamps um, with our our advanced earth resistance testers. So we have got the 6471, 6472, which are advanced earth resistance testers. And they have the ability to use these additional clamps, um, basically while doing earth resistance measurements. So by using a single clamp, we can perform the selective test, removing the need to disconnect the earth electrode. So you'll remember in the selective method, if we've got a multiple earth system or we've got multiple uh, parallel paths to earth, we can use the clamp to actually select exactly the earth electrode that we want to measure and really narrow down on that without having to disrupt the installation, disconnect it, or uh, or take anything apart. Um, we can also use these with two coils to do a completely stakeless test, just like we would with the uh, the uh, the dual coil clamps. Um, and you can see here on the right hand side the chap actually carrying out that test by using the two coils. So this is really something that's an advantage with the advanced earth resistance test, the six four seven one six four seven two. So. If you are thinking about buying an earth resistance tester and you think this might be useful, again, this is another feature you can actually add on and really makes those, those worth getting. Now, we talked a little bit about the, the pylon test kit. Um, and this is an addition to the uh, 6472. So if you've got a 6472 earth resistance tester, you can actually buy... Um, along with it, the 6474, which is the uh, the pylon test adapter. Um, and that comes with a kit. It comes with all the Rogowski coils and all of the spikes and the long leads and everything that you need to, to carry that out. And you'll see here that you connect the two together, and this acts as a sort of little add-on um, adapter box where we connect the Rogowski coils to. And you can select on here how many coils you're using, how many um, turns on each coil and things like that. And that allows you to do it. So, yeah, if you are looking to, to do the this um, pylon test method, the quick pylon test method with the Rogowski coils, um, this is the kit that you need to buy. And it's the, uh, the 6474 that adds to the 6472 and actually gives you the ability to carry out these tests. And as I said, it's not just for pylons. You know, we can do this on pretty much any earth metallic structure as well. You know, you saw in the in the, the presentation there where we tried it out with a lighting column and it worked um, perfectly with that as well. So there's loads of different applications that you'll see on these and it is a hell of a lot quicker than carrying out the, uh, uh, the standard fall of potential test and also gives you a lot more data like leakage currents and things like that as well. So definitely one to consider there if you're, if you're looking at that type of testing. So now just talking a little bit, a bit about soil resistivity. Um, and if you want to get into soil resistivity testing, um, really the starting point for us is the 6460 and the 6462. So they will perform soil resistance measurements, but you'll need to manually calculate the resistivity row using the correct formula for either the Wenner or the Schlumberger method. Um, so yes, these will give you a soil resistance measurement and then you need to change that into resistivity. So that's what the equation's for really there. But it's, it's you know, quite straightforward. And I'm sure you could program it into a spreadsheet or, you know, that side of things to, to be able to do that. Particularly if you're doing the, the Wenner method, it's a, it's a very easy calculation anyway. So if you are thinking of getting into soil resistivity testing and you just want to, you know, dip your toe into it, you just want to get started, then... The 6460 and the 6462 are our starting point for that. The difference between the two is the 6462 has got a rechargeable battery. Um, so that's the difference. But they both come in a, a sort of pelly type hard case. They're really, you know, rugged, um, easy to use, use instruments. So, yeah, highly recommended. But that's really a starting point. And that's what we call manual soil resistivity testers because you do need to do the calculation yourself. Now, advanced soil resistivity testers, so if you get the 6470, 6471, and 6472, these are advanced soil resistivity testers. So these testers have a dedicated resistivity mode and will automatically calculate rho uh, for you when told the method used and the electrode spacing. So you set them to either the Wenner method or the Schlumberger method, and then you tell them the electrode spacings and then up on the screen will come your soil resistance, but will also give you the soil resistivity as well. Um, so if you are doing a lot of these type of tests, it generally is worth probably going for these because it just saves you that extra bit of hassle. Um, they've also got advanced features like the ability to store the results and download them into our data view software as well. 
So it just saves you writing everything down. You can store the results as you go and then download those into the software. And you've just got that. So if you're doing a lot of soil resistivity testing, as I say, definitely worth a look. Now, just a little bit, just to, to finish off the process, really. We have got our data view um, reporting software. And the data view software does work with our, our advanced resistivity testers um, and our advanced earth resistance testers. So you can do fall of potential plots. You can store your data. You can configure the testers and all those sort of things by using the data view software. And then obviously you can output that in a standard report template um, and share that with your customers in the form of a PDF document, you know, with all your details on your company branding and all those sort of things. So definitely... Um, a feature that if you are doing this professionally and you want to be able to turn out you know really professional looking reports um the data view software just remember you know data view software is there and it's really something for the the more advanced earth resistance testers and to finish up with we have got a wide range of kits and accessories available so when you are carrying out these tests, you will need, you know, your earth spikes, you will need long leads, you will need your hammer and all that sort of stuff. So we've got loads. I've only shown a couple of kits here, but there's loads of different permutations of longer leads, shorter leads, different spikes, all sorts of things. So um, just be aware when you are doing it, you know, have a look what comes with your testers and you might need to get additional kits or longer leads or something to actually facilitate the type of test you're doing. Particularly if you have got quite, you know, large grid areas or you want to measure quite deep in the ground, you may need longer leads and things. And obviously we've got all that available. So there you go. That gives you a quick overview of the uh, the products that we have from Chauvin Arnu for doing earth resistance testing and, and soil resistivity testing. And obviously, if you want any more information about this or you want a demonstration on any of these, please get in touch with us and we'd be more than happy to uh, to advise you. So let's just sum up what we've covered in the webinar today. So the webinar was entitled New Earth Resistance Testing Techniques. And as part of this webinar, we looked at the requirements from the IET uh, Guidance Note 3. Um, we looked at the three methods that were in there, E1, E2, E3. And we said we'd covered E1 and E3 in the previous webinar. And we had a look at E2, which was the clamp or stakeless method. So then we moved on to look at more detail at the clamp and stakeless method. And we looked at the selective option. So using one clamp to actually make sure with a, a multiple earth system that we could actually measure just that earth and not through other earth stakes or parallel paths. And we looked at the stakeless system where we use either a dual coil clamp or two separate um, clamps to actually carry out uh, testing of the, the earth loop. Then we went on to look at the, um, the pylon testing kit. So we looked at how we could test um, sort of earth metallic structures using Rogowski coils and our pylon test kit. So the 6472 and the 6474 together um, to be able to carry out those sort of tests. Then we went on to have a look at soil resistivity testing and how to carry out a soil resistivity survey using the Wenner method or the um, Slumberger method. Um, and then to finish up with, we had a, an overview of the actual products that we've got available so that you know when you want to carry this out, what products we've actually got available for you to select. So this brings the, the webinar pretty much to a close now, but just a few things we wanted to cover. Um, we have got another webinar coming up next month. Um, so towards the end of March, the 24th and 25th of March, we're actually going to be looking at low resistance measurements. So using our low resistance ohm meters to carry out uh, measurements on things like earthing systems, buzz bars, um, and all that sort of uh, sort of uh, equipment. So again, if you haven't already, sign up for that one. Um, and that'll be coming along in about a month's time at the end of March. So thank you for attending the session today. Remember before you leave to actually go to the handout section and download the uh, the PDF copy of the, the presentation slides. You'll also automatically receive a certificate of attendance that will be emailed out to you after the session. And we have also got our previous webinars available on demand. So if you want to have a look at the previous webinars, whether that's the previous earth resistance testing webinar or our, our previous test, um, webinars on um, power quality and energy um, efficiency, um, if you go to our website, www.caUK.tv, 
you'll be able to see on there the webinar section and that's where you can go to sign up for new webinars and you'll see the new webinars we've got available but you can also watch the uh, the old webinars again so please give that a look so what we're going to do now is we're going to go over to the live q a so if you can get your uh, questions typed into the questions box and we'll answer those now so just give us a couple of seconds and we'll start the live q a